this short act of worship. It's great to have you with us. I don't know about you, but I've been getting a little restless. I'm one of those people who has to get out from my familiar surroundings on a regular basis. I'm asking God, how long, Lord? I know God is in control and his faithfulness hasn't changed. I know his timeline is different from ours. And I know this time of waiting is uh, a preparation time for all the new things that God is going to do in us and through us. I'm delighted that Caroline Gilmore is going to share a message with us today uh, with a focus on waiting and doing things differently and trusting in God's unfailing provision for us. Uh, then hopefully Scott Bradley is, is then going to share how he, used, uh, he has used this waiting time to spend time in God's presence. 
I love Psalm 56 verse 3 which says from the Passion Translation it says but in the day that I'm afraid I lay my fears before you and I guess my frustrations too and trust in you with all my heart let's just pray together Lord when we find ourselves restless in the waiting Help us focus on you as we meet in your presence here this morning. Lord, we give you all our worship as we know you are always at work in our waiting. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. Um, the reading this morning, um, or whenever you're seeing this, is taken from John chapter 21 um, and it's verses 1 to 14. After this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, this time at the Tiberias Sea, the Sea of Galilee, and this is how he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas nicknamed Twin, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the brothers Zebedee and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. The rest of them replied, we're going with you. They went out and got in the boat. They caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't recognise him. Jesus spoke to them. Good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? They answered, no. He said, throw your net off the right side of the boat and see what happens. They did what he said, and all of a sudden there were so many fish in it, they weren't strong enough to pull it in. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the master. Simon Peter realised it was the master. He threw on some clothes, for he was stripped for work, and he dove into the sea. The other disciples came in by boat, for they weren't far from land, a hundred yards or so, and they were pulling along the net full of fish. When they got out of the boat, they saw a fire led with fish and bread cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter joined them and pulled the net to shore. 153 big fish. And even with all those fish, the net didn't rip. Jesus said, come and have breakfast with me. Not one of the disciples dared ask, who are you? <laughs> they knew it was the master. So Jesus then took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. So this was now the third time that Jesus had shown himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. Hi everyone. Um, this is really strange. I've never recorded a preach or a, a reflection before, and it's very odd to be talking to a camera rather than people, but let's see how this goes. Let's just pray for a moment. Father God, we ask that you will speak to us again from your word. Teach us and encourage us and remind us of your love for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, looking at the story that Mark read, um, it's a fascinating one because it's very much from the sort of in-between time. It's from that period between the resurrection and Pentecost where um, it was the first 40 days of this period, if you like, and of course that's where the word quarantine comes from, so it's probably got a lot to say to us at the moment. Um, the disciples' world was all over the place. They were full of emotional highs and lows. They'd had the resurrection. Uh, well, they'd had the death first, then the resurrection, and then Jesus disappeared, and then he popped up again, and then he disappeared again, and then he turned up again, and they were never quite sure where they were going to meet him, when he was going to turn up. Also, if you read all the Gospels, you find a whole load of conflicting advice. It seems like in some Gospels, they're told to go to Galilee and wait for Jesus there. In another Gospel, they're told to wait in Jerusalem. And then ultimately... Um, they're sort of not sure where they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to be doing. They followed Jesus for three years, and you sort of think, I'm sure that had its complications and its challenges, the things they understood, the things they didn't. But when he said, follow me, they just did. They went where Jesus went, and they did what Jesus told them to do. But now he's not actually there, they must be sitting around a bit wondering, where am I supposed to go today? What am I supposed to do today? How, how do I follow him now? It's a totally different world to what we had before. 
And so it's confusing, it's uncertain, it's maybe really stressful, as confusing and uncertain times tend to be, but um, they're just a bit lost, I guess. So what do they do? Like most of us, they go back to what they know. We find them here, back in Galilee, and Peter, who's probably been sitting around twiddling his thumbs, says, I'm going fishing. It's what he knows how to do. It's what he's comfortable with. And apart from anything else, they do have to make ends meet, and they have to eat. So he's going to go and do fishing. He relies on his own resources, on the things he already knows what to do. But of course, the disciples aren't actually the same as they were when Jesus first called them. They're not quite sure what they're doing, but they do know they've been told to wait. And there's a word called liminal, which describes that sort of space of in-between times, of things in between things. It's described as a transitional point, being on a boundary, being on the verge of something, when you're not quite sure what that next something is. And I think there's so many parallels here in our current situation, all the upheaval. Maybe we lived the first few weeks of quarantine as a sort of holiday. We know how to deal with holiday. We can have a bit of fun. We can have a bit of relaxation. But now it's dragged on a bit. Not so sure. And all our usual ways of coping have been taken away. There was a nurse on the news the other day who was talking about the fact that although their days are really stressful, the real problem is that their ways of unwinding have been taken away. They can't go home and spend time with family, can't go out for a meal, go down the pub, have a glass of wine, whatever they would do to relax. And that's been taken away as well. And for us, maybe our ways of worshipping, our ways of following Jesus have been taken away or certainly aren't the same as they were before. So now what? And what happens is Jesus pops up unexpectedly. He pops up maybe in our gardens, in our flats, in our houses. And then he disappears again. He's there sometimes and he appears not to be. How do we li live this sort of waiting space, this liminal space? Part of it is waiting to see Jesus when he turns up. We've got the time to reflect and notice when he does turn up, to have a chat with him, to speak to him, to find him, learning to recognise him maybe. But also, I think sometimes when Jesus appears not to be there, it's time for us to reflect and, and remember what it was like when he wasn't in our life and to see, like the disciples maybe, how far we've come since the first time we were in Galilee. When they first met Jesus in Galilee, they had no idea what he was like, what he meant. And now, three years later, they're in a very different place, even if actually they're physically back in Galilee again. And maybe the same for us, just to remind ourselves and remember how far we've come. Take it as a bit of a respite before the next step and just a chance to reflect and see where we've got to. I think the second point I wanted to uh, talk about in this passage is um, when we see Jesus turn up in this situation, when the night's fishing has just been fruitless and probably rather frustrating. And he comes along and he says, throw the net on the other side of the boat and then there's loads of fish. Now, people who fished in that area say that from the shore you get a different perspective. So whether it was pure miracle or whether just Jesus standing on the shore could see through the water differently and tell them, no, no, the shoal of fish is on the other side of the boat. Jesus' perspective brings a difference. They're still using the abilities and what they know how to do, but actually they're doing it differently. And Jesus' challenge to us is maybe to do things differently, not to carry on doing the same things we've always been doing. I know a lot of us have learned a good few new skills on the internet and Zoom meetings and goodness knows what else. But more than that, it's thinking about how we bring people together. It's a challenge about how we use our buildings in church and turn that more to the interest in people. For Mark and myself, we were realising that instead of just tootling about our daily business, maybe standing in the supermarket queue or doing the food bank deliveries, to be a little bit more intentional about that, to be looking out for Jesus telling us to do something differently, to have a more meaningful conversation with someone, to actually interact with someone a bit more differently. 
I'd say that uh, probably one of the skills I felt that I have is ability to sort of bring people together in a celebration or something. When you can't do that, what do you do? Actually take the initiative to reach out to people on an individual basis. Try something different and do things a bit differently. And it's when we do that and when the disciples did that, they recognise Jesus. The disciple that Jesus loved said, it's the master, they've seen him. So again, it's the same but different. The two places they mention the sort of fire um, that's on the beach here is also mentioned in the courtyard where Peter denied Jesus. There was a fire there using the same word. And the fish that were ready on the fire is the same word as was used in the feeding of the 5,000. And then you have the image of Jesus breaking bread and giving. All things that they've seen before, but this time they're a bit different. And so they're being challenged to maybe do what they've done before, be fishers, but actually now to really be fishers of men instead. A bit like the same, but different. Throw our nets out on the other side of our boats. And then I think finally, as always with Jesus, there's this lovely bit at the end of the passage. There's always grace and there's always provision. He's pre prepared breakfast for them on the beach. The breakfast is already there, whether they'd caught the fish or not, whether they recognised him or not, whether maybe like Peter, they were struggling through water to get to him or trying to drag a net in on a heavy laden boat. Jesus is already there providing breakfast for them. And in his generosity, he even says, you can bring some of the fish you've caught as well. He is willing for us to share in what he's offering. But it's the ultimate reassurance, I think. Some of us might have felt that this time has been lived in a special way, that we felt especially close to God. We've got closer to understanding him, there's new revelations. We've been more involved with our families, maybe with volunteering or something. But some of us might also feel that we've been a bit swamped, we're very anxious, we've been left out, or maybe even we feel guilty. But remember Peter, the last, well, the last times he'd seen Jesus, he'd been denying him. So guilt can be part of this too, but the food and the company is still there, prepared for all of us. He invites all of us, encouraging us to come and share with him what we do have, not what we don't. So as always, his generous grace and provision is for all of us, for everyone. So here is invitation. Come and have breakfast with me. Amen. Morning church, hope everyone's feeling okay today. I just wanted to come and share with you guys this morning about my life, where it is today, and my faith. Kevin asked me in the week, he makes me laugh, Kevin. Over a year ago, I was sitting in my flat and I just couldn't stop using drink and drugs. My relationship with my kids and my girlfriends, my mum and everyone around me was just so painful. And I hated myself. I couldn't even look in the mirror. And then something happened, I ended up coming into recovery. And it was amazing. In a couple of weeks of being in there, I met a guy who's my sponsor today, which I'm forever grateful for. He took me through the 12 step recovery program. And I can remember the first day he asked me to pray. I was just listening to him really and just doing what he suggested. I used to go upstairs and hide away out of the way of everyone and get on my knees. My life started to change quite quick as we went through this program of recovery. The amazing thing about it was I kept getting a day clean and sober. And everything around me started to change. My relationship with my children got better, with my girlfriend, I started to speak to my mum a lot more. I even started to come to church, which I really enjoyed on Sunday mornings. This isolation we're in today, 
I've really quite enjoyed it. I've even done some decorating in the house. But you know what the one of the biggest thing for me is? I never got any peace. And today I can just come and sit in the garden and just sit and enjoy the weather. I even started reading a few books. I've even picked up the Bible. That's a big book. The one bit in there that really stood out to me, which holds dear to my heart is, I fear not, I am with you. And why I share that is, I lost my father over 15 years ago. And do you know what? I can sit here and it's like, I, ha I have a new father and that's all I choose to call God today. I suppose that what is blind, that is what is blind faith. As I said, my life is so different and I've really enjoyed isolation, especially sitting reading. I feel I have a new strength in me and a lot more love. I can even look in the mirror at myself today. Me and Jane have been over the last couple of weeks going down to the food bank in Maynham, helping out. Really enjoyed doing that too. As I said, I don't find this easy sitting talking to a piece of plastic. But I really just wanted to come and share with you guys today of where my life is. And the inner peace I get today, even just sitting with myself. So do you know what, I'm going to leave it there guys, I just really wanted to come and share that with you and also the amount of new friends I've made in recovery, it's been amazing and I just want to thank God for what he's doing for me. I got in the van this morning to go out and I listened to Smooth and the song come on, Electric Dreams, we'll always be together. And it just lit me up. So look guys, hope you're having a lovely day. And God bless to you all. And um, hopefully I'll see you at church soon when we get out of this isolation. God bless. <laughs>
Thank you.